The man who adopted baby Elsie Scully Hicks is the definition of a wolf in sheep's clothing. A man who the world deemed a patient, loving man with a kind heart was truly evil at his core. After news came out about what he did, no one could believe that this man could be capable of inflicting such horror onto such an innocent, adorable baby. Elsie suffered so much in her short life, and this case truly goes to show that you really don't know anyone as well as you think you do. But before we get into this horrific, heartbreaking case, I want to take a moment to talk about one thing that does bring me joy, and that is affordable, cute jewelry. Ana Luisa is a jewelry brand built to deliver simple, beautiful, high-quality jewelry at a fair price. Starting at only $39, they really have something for everyone with their long-lasting, water-resistant jewelry essentials that not only make you look good, but you can feel good about wearing them. Ana Luisa jewelry is made to stand the test of time with strength and humidity testing with pieces that won't break your budget. I've been loving these little dainty hoops that I've been wearing every single day. The hoop I have in my first piercing has the cutest little butterfly dangly. Then the second piercing I have is a little double hoop that I am in love with. I love having pieces that I can wear every day. I sleep in them, I shower in them, I do everything in them to subtly uplift my whole look. Then I have these medium hoops for when I want to get a little fancier, like when I'm going out with friends or out for a date night. Ana Luisa has so many different pieces that can really show your personality. Ana Luisa offers free and fast U.S. shipping and exchanges, as well as affordable worldwide shipping. So next time you want to grab a piece for your next get-together, or you just want to treat yourself, you'll be ready. Plus, with Ana Luisa's worry-free guarantee, you will get a two-year warranty on all their products, making it that much easier to decide to grab a couple pieces to treat yourself or even a friend. So go ahead and give Ana Luisa's jewelry a tryout for yourself. You can get up to 25% off their already affordable prices when you head to their website using my link down below. Once again, click the link in the description box below and you can get up to 25% off your order. Thank you again so much to Ana Luisa for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's heartbreaking case. Elsie Scully Hicks was born on November 17th, 2014 under the name Shayla O'Brien. Elsie had a rough start to her life. Her mother was a drug addict who was not providing the proper care for Elsie, so she was taken away by social services and placed into the foster care system. By September 10th, 2015, when she was around 10 months old, she was placed into the care of then 30-year-old Matthew and 35-year-old Craig Scully Hicks. Now, Craig and Matthew were living in Cardiff, South Wales at the time. They met back in 2006, and by 2012, the two were married. By all accounts, they had a healthy, loving relationship, and soon after getting married, they decided they were ready to start a family. So, they worked with the courts to eventually become approved as adopters. Shortly after being approved, they welcomed their first child into their home, a baby who was only referred to in court documents as C, in order to protect her identity. Now, Matthew had previously worked as an employer services consultant, but after having this baby placed into their care, Matthew decided to become a stay-at-home dad while Craig continued working full-time, although Matthew did still pick up some hours part-time working as a fitness instructor. Matthew and Craig seemed to quickly adjust to this new life. They worked together to provide a loving, caring home for C. Matthew definitely took on more childcare responsibility since Craig's job often kept him away from the home, but they did both play a significant role in raising little C. After this baby was placed with them, the courts continued following up to make sure she was being cared for properly, and for a while, things seemed to be going great. Then, by September of 2015, Matthew and Craig decided that they were ready to open their hearts and their homes to a new baby. As I said, this is when 10-month-old Shayla was placed into their care, and also when her name was changed to Elsie Scully Hicks. At first, it seemed like this was a great fit for Elsie. Again, Matthew and Craig appeared to be loving, caring parents who wanted nothing but the best for Elsie and her big sister. After about six months under the care of Matthew and Craig, they officially adopted her into their family. 
things seem to be going amazing. However, going back just a little bit, after about a month and a half in their care, problems did start to arise. By November 9th, 2015, Matthew took Elsie to her primary care doctor with reports of a leg injury that occurred under his watch while his husband was at work. Matthew told the doctor that four days prior, on the 5th, that Elsie was pushing a baby walker when she leaned back and twisted her leg as she fell backwards. After this initial incident happened, Elsie didn't seem to be in too much pain. But after discussing it with Craig, he decided to take her in and get it looked at. That is why it took a couple of days to bring her in. At the appointment, it seemed like Elsie was having a hard time putting any weight on her leg, so it was suspected that she may have suffered a fracture. Her doctor recommended they follow up with the hospital for imaging, so an appointment was made for the 12th of November. At the hospital, Matthew told the doctor the same story he gave the primary physician days prior. Elsie had gotten some x-rays done, and the doctor determined that she had suffered from a minimally displaced fracture to her right distal tibia just above her ankle. She was given a cast and told that she should avoid any weight bearing on that leg for at least three weeks while the bone healed. It was determined that her injury was consistent with the fall from a walking toy, so no concerns were raised. Then, after the initial casting, her leg healed really well, completely as expected. However, as the months passed, Elsie would continue sustaining various injuries, all with different stories to accompany them. By December 16th, 2015, Matthew notified his caseworker, Laura Neal, that Elsie had sustained a bruise to the left side of her forehead over her eye. By December 21st, another caseworker, Jody, visited the home to check in on Elsie and C. And at that time, Jody also noticed the bruise to Elsie's forehead. Matthew didn't have much of an explanation for this bruise at the time, but he would later explain how it happened. He said that Elsie was in her play kitchen when she pulled herself into standing using the cabinet door handles. The doors opened unexpectedly, so Elsie lost her balance and hit her head on the worktop of the play kitchen. That is how she got the bruise. No matter how she got the bruise though, after seeing it, Jody told Matthew to get medical treatment for it, and Matthew said he did. However, it's thought that he never actually saw anyone for the bruise. As far as I could find, no further concern was raised, so no further action was taken. Months passed without any further incidents until March 10th, 2016. This time, Matthew dialed 999 to report that Elsie was pulling herself up on a gate located at the top of the stairs, but the latch wasn't fully closed, so it opened, causing Elsie to lose her balance and then fall down a full flight of stairs. As it happened, he was in the next room using the washing machine, so he didn't see it actually happen. After the fall, Elsie didn't cry when Matthew initially found her but she laid still at the bottom of the stairs with her eyes wide open, which was obviously concerning. By the time he called emergency services, Elsie did start to cry. When paramedics arrived, Elsie had already vomited twice, one of which had some blood in it. Of course, it was thought that she could have suffered a head injury, so she was immediately taken to the hospital for treatment. Once there, Elsie's condition seemed to drastically improve, so I guess they decided not to do a CT scan. That makes absolutely no sense to me, as I feel like she should have gotten one regardless of how she was in that moment due to how the injury occurred to begin with. That's just my opinion. But either way, Matthew reports that after the hospital visit, Elsie wasn't totally acting like herself, and she did throw up a few more times, though this lessened over the following days. Then, by April 16th, over a month after the fall, Craig noticed that Elsie's left eye started turning inwards towards her nose. Over time, it seemed to get progressively worse. But this wasn't reported to the caseworkers, nor did they seek medical treatment. This is concerning because if there is a change in vision or eye movement after a head injury, that can be a sign that something more is going on. It can be a sign of a serious neurological issue. But again, nothing was done about it. By this point, anytime Elsie had an issue and went to the doctor, the story of what happened seemed to match her injury. Social workers were continuing to check in on the family, and Matthew and Craig continued to present as concerned, caring parents. Despite the accidents Elsie had, she was being well cared for. The morning of May 25th, 2016 started as any normal day. 
Elsie appeared to be happy and healthy. She went with Matthew to Gym Tots that morning, then spent the rest of the day doing activities with her older sister, C, and Matthew's niece, Carrie. They returned home after their fun day, with Carrie leaving around 5.20 p.m. After that, Matthew fed the girls dinner, finishing by 5.45 p.m. After dinner, Matthew put Elsie in front of the TV with her sister, C, where they sat happily and content. By around 6 p.m., Matthew changed Elsie's diaper and then put her into a onesie before lying her back on the floor while he went into the other room to finish making some tea and to throw away the dirty diaper. When he left the room, Matthew said that Elsie was happy and calm. However, once he returned back into the room, to his surprise and dismay, Elsie was unresponsive. She was lying on her back on the floor with her eyes open, staring blankly. She was completely still and not breathing. Immediately upon finding her, he dialed 999 to call for help. They're adopting her. Okay, well, I need to know what the name she's going by now. Uh, we, she's known as Elsie to us. Okay, and what's Elsie's surname? Uh, Scully Hicks. Scully Hicks, okay. Elsie. 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 Is she responding to you at all there? Her eyes are opening and they're rolling round. She, I think she's looking at me now, but she's not moving. That's fine. Obviously, we're just going to, as long as she's conscious, that's the main thing, okay? So just leave her there and, as I said, don't move her. Just stay with her now. Just keep her comforted, okay? unlock for me okay yeah and just if there's any pets there can you just put them away for me yeah we've got cats but they're upstairs they're upstairs out the way that's okay is Elsie on any medication at all no Elsie okay and can you see any obvious injuries there I can't see anything. She's like she's responding when I touch her. Like her eyes are opening more. But it's just not moving. Okay. She's probably shocked as well. Okay. So obviously, if you just make, just make her as comfortable as you can without moving her. Okay. Okay. And just keep talking to her there. Elsie. Elsie. As he was connected to the dispatcher and waited for help to arrive, Matthew started performing CPR on Elsie, desperately hoping to bring her back. By the time first responders arrived, they took over CPR and got her into an ambulance to be transported to the hospital. When she arrived to the Children's Hospital for Wales, she was clearly in dire condition. She was transferred to the ICU, where she was placed on life support. For the four days that followed, medical staff tried desperately to provide whatever medical treatment they needed to save Elsie's life. Matthew and Craig held their breath as they hoped and prayed for Elsie to be okay. However, tragically, by May 29, 2016, 18-month-old Elsie was removed from life support and she passed away. At this point, no one knew exactly what happened or what caused Elsie to decline so rapidly. It seemed so sudden, so out of nowhere, and everyone involved in her life wanted answers. Now, after little Elsie was admitted to the hospital, of course, her doctors performed multiple tests and took imaging. After her death, she was also sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy. Based on the findings from both her pediatrician and the ME, we get a pretty clear picture of just how much this baby suffered in the days and weeks leading to her death. And just a warning, what you are about to hear is absolutely horrific. It was found that Elsie had a bruise to her forehead just above her left eye. Then they found that she suffered a full thickness skull fracture, extensive bilateral subdural hemorrhages with evidence of chronic and acute bleeding, as well as severe hypoxic ischemic brain damage. Basically, they found extensive bleeding in the area between the layers of your brain and skull and found that the brain was deprived of oxygen for long enough that it caused damage. 
In addition to that, Elsie suffered damage to her retina and her optic nerve, and as if that wasn't enough, they also found small fractures on her third and fourth ribs. The medical examiner determined that these injuries were consistent with the shaking type of injury. Her cause of death was determined to be the result of hypoxic encephalopathy following a cardiac arrest accompanied by a blunt head injury. It was stated that the fractures to her skull were acute, meaning they happened immediately before her death. Based on where the injuries were found, it's thought that someone picked Elsie up very forcefully around her torso, causing those rib fractures. She was then shaken repeatedly and aggressively, and in the process, her head slammed against a hard surface, causing the bruising to her forehead and that skull fracture. The significant force of the shaking also caused severe brain and eye damage. Her collapse was most likely immediately following this event. After her collapse, there was nothing anyone could have done to save her. In addition to the imaging taken from this hospital admittance, they also decided to re-examine the x-rays taken from that November 9th visit. As I stated before, the original doctor determined that Elsie had suffered a single fracture to her tibia right above her ankle. However, upon looking at the image a second time, they found a second fracture. This time, they found another fracture to her distal femur right by the growth plate, which is pretty much where your knee joint is. Finding this second fracture raised a lot of concerns for two reasons. One, your femur is a pretty tough bone to crack, even for kids, so that would require a lot of force. You really only see it with things like car accidents or really severe falls. Second, the doctor felt that it would be unusual for Elsie to have sustained two fractures from one minor fall. Again, Elsie apparently fell after standing at her walker per Matthew's reporting. This isn't something that should cause multiple fractures. So now this story isn't seeming all that reliable. Before her autopsy was complete, investigators couldn't be sure that there was anything suspicious about Elsie's death. They obviously were concerned, but they didn't immediately question Craig or Matthew because they were satisfied with their original stories. This was a tragic accident. However, after discovering these injuries in the autopsy, it became clear that Elsie suffered from some sort of abuse that led to her death. Finally, over a month after Elsie's death, by July 12, 2016, Craig was taken in for an interview. He explained that he was working full-time and that he could be away from the home for two to three days at a time most weeks during the time they had Elsie. He said that she was a very active, bubbly little girl. She was a bit more colicky and more whiny than C and had a bit of a harder time adjusting to life with them. But overall, she was a happy girl with a healthy attachment to both her dads. He explained that he was at work when Elsie sustained that fracture back in November. After Matthew told him about it, Elsie seemed happy and content. She didn't seem to be in too much pain. However, he did notice that she was avoiding putting weight on that leg, so he advised Matthew to get her to a doctor, which he did. He said that Matthew explained the bruise she sustained in December as well, and he had no reason to question it. When it came to the March incident where Elsie fell down the stairs, he said that he also wasn't home for this. By the time he got to the hospital that day after finding out what happened, Elsie looked fine. She was sitting on Matthew's lap, alert and happy. She had been a bit sore and whiny over the few days after, but otherwise, Craig didn't notice anything out of the ordinary with her. He also mentioned her eye turning in, but once again, this didn't seem to be that much of a concern for Craig. He explained that on the evening of May 25th, Matthew called him hysterically crying. He told him what happened to little Elsie, and he seemed genuinely upset. Once again, even with everything that was going on, even after Elsie's death, Craig never felt that there was any reason to question Matthew. He seemed like a loving, caring parent. Craig never saw him raise his voice or yell at his kids. He never seemed angry or aggressive towards them, and he certainly never saw Matthew lay a hand on them. Matthew had always been very calm, mild-mannered, and patient towards the children, and Elsie had never shown any signs of fear around him. She willingly went with him and was affectionate towards him. After this interview with Craig, of course, officers took Matthew in for questioning. Officers asked about the day-to-day -day with him caring for Elsie, and he said that she could be whiny, but she never screamed or cried too much. She never gave him too much of a hard time. 
Officers asked if he ever felt overwhelmed or incapable of caring for Elsie, and he said no. He said he never felt that Elsie's behaviors were consuming him or that he couldn't cope. He said that Elsie was a happy little girl and he was happy to have her. He told officers pretty much everything I've told you up to this point. How Elsie sustained her various injuries and what happened to her on the night she collapsed. Matthew pondered if maybe Elsie had Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which would cause her to be more susceptible to injury from things that may not harm typically developing children. He also wondered if she had Second Impact Syndrome, suggesting that maybe she suffered a re-bleed after that fall down the stairs in March. Maybe she had overstrained herself while having a bowel movement, causing her injury to come back. However, I do want to take now as a moment to note that the medical examiner's report stated that while a re-bleed is possible after a fall down the stairs, this type of event would not have caused the rapid decline we saw in Elsie. Therefore, the brain bleed she suffered, as well as the skull fracture, had to have happened immediately preceding her death. Now, as the autopsy was being complete and medical experts were reviewing the case, C was removed from the care of Matthew and Craig. There was some back and forth in the courts regarding who she should be placed with, whether it be like extended family of Matthew or Craig, but it was ultimately decided that she would go to a foster home. Then, for the months that followed Elsie's death, investigators continued to work tirelessly to put together a clear picture of what happened and hopefully bring the person responsible for her death to justice. As the investigation continued, officers started speaking with neighbors of Matthew and Craig's. One neighbor reported that she was aware of Craig and Matthew's general schedule. One went to work while the other stayed home, and the one that went to work was sometimes out for days at a time. This neighbor reported that oftentimes while Craig was at work, she would hear Elsie crying. It typically started around 8 a.m., and when this happened, she would hear Matthew ranting and yelling. He would yell at Elsie to shut the F up quite often. Then, this neighbor's son, who also lived in the home, often heard crying as well. When the crying would happen, he would hear Matthew screaming, ugh, and doors being slammed. One time, he heard Matthew respond to the crying by saying, shut up, you little effing brat. Another time, he said, shut up, you silly little c-word. Then, other times, he would hear music absolutely blasting to drown out the crying. On other occasions, he heard the sound of plates crashing and breaking. This whole situation of Matthew becoming angry and screaming and slamming doors and breaking things, this happened at least weekly, according to neighbors. They went on to say that it was obvious to them that Matthew was having a very difficult time bonding with Elsie, though they were never necessarily concerned for her safety. So obviously, this is a stark contrast to what Matthew and Craig both told officers. This picture of a mild-mannered, calm, patient father seemed to just be a front. In reality, when he was alone, he had a really difficult time dealing with Elsie. As a part of the investigation, officers also decided to take a look into Matthew's cell phone records, text messages, and social media. And once again, what they found paints a picture of a man who is having a lot of trouble coping with being a father to this new baby. These messages are between either Matthew and Craig or various friends of Matthew's, and they read as follows. In one text to a friend, Matthew says, I'm going through hell with Elsie. Mealtimes and bedtimes are my worst nightmare at the minute. She has been up there screaming for 10 minutes nonstop. She just stopped, but I doubt that's the last I'll hear tonight. In another text to his husband, Craig, Matthew refers to Elsie as Satan in a baby grow and continues, Elsie has had two nights of being Satan. Then there are more texts where they're both joking about calling a priest if Elsie did not stop behaving like Satan. As I said earlier, Craig had a job that would keep him away from home for a few days at a time some weeks. During one of these stretches, Matthew wrote to Craig, ready to explode. It's been a difficult few days. Continuing, it's a long-standing issue. She wakes up at regular intervals during the night. She just wants to be given her dummy and attention, but she has a proper diva strobe about it all. We think someone used to bring her downstairs in the middle of the night, which we don't do. She's pissy because we don't let her. Once again, we can see that Matthew was struggling. Now, like I said, Craig said to police that Matthew seemed like a very caring, patient father. Obviously, these messages kind of suggest otherwise. 
But I do want to note that even though Matthew may have been expressing these things over text, all Craig ever saw in person was Matthew being calm and patient. I'm not a parent, but I'm sure most, if not all, parents have vented to others about how bad their kid is, maybe even calling them a little Satan. Being overwhelmed as a parent is 100% normal and it happens to everyone. So knowing what we know now, yes, these messages are indicators that Matthew is having a hard time. However, at the time that Craig was getting these messages, I can see how he wouldn't think much of them, thinking that Matthew was just venting. Either way, again, Matthew clearly was having a hard time with Elsie and knowing everything we know now, it's clear that he lashed out at her quite often. This was not the case for their other daughter, C. It seems that Matthew truly was a good, attentive, loving father towards C. Matthew, Craig, and C had their routine and life was easy. But then when Elsie came in, everything got screwed up and she had a hard time adjusting to C's schedule. She had her own needs and required special attention. It seemed that this was not something that Matthew was equipped to handle. She cried more often than C. She frustrated the hell out of him and he simply couldn't control his anger and frustration. Throughout his time with Elsie, he had a regular visit with social services caseworkers. Multiple people had checked in with him to see how things were going. In situations like this, it's always understood that a child may not be a good fit for a certain home, so there's always an out. A foster parent can turn the kid back over if they can't handle them. They had six months with her before they actually adopted her, so they could have given her up at any time. Yet, despite this, Matthew never expressed any concerns to caseworkers. He never spoke up about his issues to his own husband, Craig, either. He never asked for additional support from anyone. Instead, he continued to grow more and more frustrated with Elsie and took out his rage on her. By November of 2016, as the investigation continued, Craig notified officers that he and Matthew had separated, though they were still doing joint supervised visits with C three times per week for about an hour and a half per visit. By this point, officers knew that Matthew caused Elsie's death and they knew it was not an accident. They knew that Matthew murdered Elsie by violently shaking her to death. So, by this point, he was arrested and charged with her murder. Also, as a part of the investigation, obviously they wanted to figure out if Craig was to blame for any of it. Did he know about the abuse? Should he have known? Could he have done more to prevent Elsie's death? Well, after hearing from those neighbors, police learned that Elsie almost never cried when Craig was home, so it's not like Craig ever witnessed Matthew's outbursts. Then, when it came to those injuries, as we heard from before, doctors pretty much always confirmed Matthew's story. They were accidental falls. Even if Craig had his suspicions, the doctors pretty much refuted them. And again, even with those text messages, it can be very easily assumed by Craig that Matthew was just venting. So by December of that same year, investigators cleared Craig of any charges relating to failing to protect Elsie. It seems like Craig truly did not know what was going on. It seems like Matthew put up the same front for Craig that he put up for everybody else. Then almost a year and a half after 18 month old Elsie's death, Matthew Scully Hicks stood trial for her murder. This entire time, Matthew denied hurting Elsie, continuing to claim that her death was just a tragic accident. However, the prosecution was arguing that Matthew murdered this baby girl by violently shaking her to death. As we discussed up to this point, there are multiple witnesses who can confirm that Matthew was having a really rough time with parenting Elsie. We heard from those neighbors confirming that anytime Elsie cried, Matthew responded by calling her nasty names, breaking things, and slamming doors. Those text messages also point to an overwhelmed father. Then, over the course of months, there were multiple occasions in which Elsie's caseworkers saw bruises on Elsie, which Matthew always explained away. She suffered from two fractures to her leg, which was concerning, but once again, the doctor only caught one of them and that fracture was explained away by Matthew. But as we now know, those leg fractures are indicative of abuse. So are those bruises. Not only did she break her leg in multiple places, but she also suffered a head injury and had to be taken into the ER after a fall down the stairs. Once again, this happened while only Matthew was home. 
Now, when it comes to this injury, the judge in this case did concede that it actually could have been from the result of a fall down the stairs by accident. There really isn't any concrete evidence to say otherwise. However, knowing what we know now about Matthew, it would be a hell of a coincidence. Then, after suffering from this physical abuse at the hands of her adopted father for months, Matthew flew off the handle once again. But this time, he took it way too far. He violently shook that baby to the point of causing brain bleeding and swelling, as well as an injury to her retina and optic nerve. These are injuries that take a substantial amount of force, even for a young child. So, according to the medical examiner, there was no way that Elsie's injuries could have been an accident. Again, the rib fractures are most likely caused from the extreme force exerted from Matthew when he was gripping around her torso when he was shaking her. Then, of course, the brain injuries are a direct result of her head violently banging back and forth repeatedly, while the skull fracture was from when her head slammed against a hard surface as the shaking was happening. Again, when it comes to the defense, all Matthew could really argue was that these injuries were all an accident and that he would never want to hurt his precious baby girl. The court did hear from multiple character witnesses, all who said the same things about Matthew, that he was a kind, patient, loving father. Even Elsie's caseworkers agreed that he was a good father and that Elsie had a healthy attachment to Matthew. She loved him. Now, when it comes to her death, the defense argued that her collapsing was from the previous injury from when she fell down the stairs. But, as we heard earlier, the medical examiner determined that based on the injuries Elsie sustained, she would have collapsed immediately after it happened. Not weeks, not months. And again, even though all these people say that Matthew was a good father, no one truly knows what someone is like when no one is around. It's entirely possible that he put up a front for the world. So, at the end of this trial, which lasted about four weeks, the prosecution and defense made their closing arguments and the jury went off for deliberations. And when they came back, they found that Matthew is in fact guilty of the murder of 18-month-old baby Elsie. In his sentencing remarks, the judge conceded that everyone around Matthew felt that he was a truly outstanding man and an even better father. He acknowledged that Matthew continues to deny murdering his daughter. However, the evidence given by the medical examiner was compelling. This was no accident. It was a murder. And Matthew was the only person who could have been responsible nobody else. In the end, the judge handed Matthew Scully Hicks a sentence of life in prison with the possibility of release after 18 years. It was said that throughout this trial, Matthew was pretty much emotionless and showed no remorse. He really only broke down after he was convicted, which to me really does show someone's true colors that they're only upset when something bad happens to them, when they have to be accountable for their actions. No tears for Elsie, only for himself. Elsie suffered serious injuries at the hands of her adopted father, and these ultimately caused her death. This was, of course, a tragic case, and our thoughts and sympathies are with Elsie's loved ones. The evidence put forward by the CPS proved that Matthew Scully Hicks was not only responsible for her injuries, but that he intended to seriously harm her. The prosecution built a case through careful and detailed analysis of witness accounts, medical evidence, and the circumstances surrounding Elsie's death. This resulted in the good guilty verdicts returned by the jury. Thank you. Our thoughts today are with little Elsie and those who knew and loved her. Her untimely death at just 18 months old has had a devastating effect, first and foremost on her family, who remain uppermost in our thoughts. Elsie's death has also impacted a wider community, including the many professionals involved in her care and the subsequent investigation. I would like to thank all of them, including the many witnesses who assisted the prosecution. This case represents an extremely rare and distressing set of circumstances, and we at South Wales Police continue to respect and value the role that adoption and those involved play in our society. Thank you very much. Also, as all of this was going on, Craig was very much outspoken about his utter disappointment in Matthew and what he did. After Elsie first died, he stood by his side. But once the medical examiner's report came out, that is when Craig knew that his own husband, the man he vowed his life to, has viciously attacked their daughter. 
Not only that, but Matthew wouldn't even admit to what he did. Of course, they did become separated as a result of all of this, and it is and continues to be believed that Craig had nothing to do with this, nor did he have any knowledge of the abuse. Which to me, in most cases, I actually don't usually believe when a parent says they didn't know their partner was harming their child. However, I can see in this case how Matthew could have manipulated Craig into believing he was a good father and that Elsie was just a clumsy girl who kept accidentally getting hurt. Again, he was gone for days at a time, and doctors and caseworkers never suspected Matthew of abuse, so why would Craig? Then, going off of that, social services also did do a review into their handling of the case, and they determined that many of the caseworkers in Matthew's case were biased. They liked Matthew. They truly felt that he was a positive parent for Elsie. Their belief in Matthew was so strong, it caused them to overlook the red flags. They never even considered that Matthew could be abusing their child. Therefore, there was a lack of professional curiosity, leading to a failure to further investigate Elsie's injuries. I, I fully accept the findings of the report. Um, the, the report, as you say, does indicate that, that social workers had a, a, and, and a staff from, from all agencies. Saw, saw the uh, adoption as very positive. Uh, they, they perceived the, the uh, adopted family as a, a very, really positive solution for, for Elsie. Um, and I, I think you know, the report is, is clear. It identifies the issue, as, as you have said, that actually that positive lens meant that they weren't looking in the way that they should have been. Um, and and so, so, so you're right. Um, that that's something they should have done. That's something that we have as an organisation recognised and we've taken that fully on board. We have in, implemented a number of checks and balances in, into the system to try and make sure that those, those, um, that, that that lens isn't, isn't there. Was that, that lens is actually, I, su I suppose, we, we take a different view. We always look every time we see anything that we consider it to be safeguarded. When you look back, at the, uh, at the pattern um, of, of injuries, particularly between the period of November 2015 uh, to March 2016, um, you can see that had there been um, one agency or maybe one worker that had all of that information, that potentially there would have been an opportunity um, to have raised safeguarding concerns. Um, as it was, each individual incident um, was seen separately and, um, and no safeguarding concerns were raised against any of those um, injuries. Of course, Elsie's death has sent shockwaves down her community, across her biological family, and within her adoptive family. Everyone in Matthew's life were absolutely shocked to find out what he did. No one believed he was capable of harming this little baby. He truly had everyone around him fooled, and for whatever reason, he chose harming that little girl over asking for some help with raising her. It's absolutely tragic and heartbreaking, and it just goes to show that you truly do not know anyone as well as you think you do. So let this serve as a lesson that even if you think someone is an amazing person with a kind heart, if you notice red flags, it's worth it to at least look into it. Follow your gut. If it's telling you that something is off, then something is probably off. This goes for domestic violence, child abuse, or even animal abuse. If you notice any red flags, it never hurts to figure out what's going on rather than just assuming that things are okay because you assume you know someone better than that. Let Elsie's death be an example of that. But that is all of the information I have on today's case, and now I want to know what you all think. Do you think Matthew purposely murdered this baby, or do you believe it was an accident? Do you think Craig knew about any of this, and what could have been done to prevent this? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!